Welcome to the second episode of Shortcast of a Coffee. Today we have with us Krish Ashok. Ashok is a modern day Da Vinci, a genuine polymath. He is a writer, a techie and a musician among many other things. He is most well known as the author of the book Masala Lab, where he breaks down cooking to its first principles and busts some popular myths about the process. This is episode 1 of my conversation with Ashok. In this episode we talk about instruments in Carnatic music. lessons learned from his own experience learning the violin and his thoughts on the pedagogy and the future of carnatic music we did experience audio issues while recording this episode and i apologize for that but i hope the quality of the content makes up for it hi shok uh, welcome to the podcast the first time i heard about you was um, on facebook uh, one of my friends shared this post called daft pankajam i think it was way back in 24 oh, yeah. long time back it was a long time back um so i i was just checking it out and it was such a i did not know about daft punk at the time which is which is pretty funny because i think 2013 they were pretty popular and i i heard it and i was like wow this is this is so incredible uh, it was a, an entirely new dimension uh, that i listened to um and i asked him who is this person uh, because i had never heard your name in carnatic circles you know i follow that that circle quite a, quite a bit so he said that uh, remember this this blog called uh, dancing uh, doing jalsa doing jalsa dan- uh, dancing jalsa showing jalpa uh, yeah exactly showing jalpa it's the same yes. person i was like wow that is that is pretty crazy like what all is he good at so just just a just an anecdote of how i came to know about you for the first time and then uh and then i got to know about uh, masala labs and and so on and and so forth so i would like to start off with uh, your musical journey uh i know that you learned violin under tn krishnan music yes and also uh, the lalgudi school of music uh why violin yes. i mean from what i know violin is such a difficult uh instrument to start off with like the the learning curve is is pretty slow and yeah. it takes a while before you get to start liking what you play right so why yeah. violin was it was it a parental pressure thing because yeah. yeah well actually pretty much i mean you know my uh my mother was uh, uh, in canara bank and uh, one of her colleagues was uh, uh one of the lalgudi family actually she uh, usha and her her son by the way is uh, is abhishek raghuram right so so she was uh, Uh, she was my mother's colleague in Canter Bank, and uh, at office picnics and so on, she would just, you know, they would ask her to, you know, play the violin, right? And uh, um, and I think, uh, you know, my mother tells me, I don't remember now, tells me that you had expressed an interest, so I, you know, I made sure that, you know, she, she I sent you to the Lalkudi School to uh, sort of learn, right? Uh, but obviously, I don't remember. I mean, it was quite a painful uh, experience of actually learning violin for the first six or seven years, right? Especially if you're a seven-year-old. Um, and again you have to keep changing violins every two or three years because you grow bigger uh, and you start off with a smaller size violin and then you have to l- learn all of that muscle memory again uh, so yeah so it is uh, i guess it's probably a combination of uh, parental pressure and maybe desire if you will uh, but you know no regrets because i think you know um, once you become good at it you sort of recognize what a what a beautifully expressive uh, instrument and uh, versatile instrument it actually is yeah so uh... in carnatic music violin is is pretty popular i think it's pretty much an essential part of any concert right what is sort of the history and evolution of violin's popularity in carnatic music uh, and one of the things that i notice is that unlike a lot of other instruments like for instance mandolin was was made really popular by us rinivas and uraju yeah yes we don't yes. see a lot of western instruments make their way into carnatic music why violin yeah. how did violin become so popular i think it it goes a fair while back i think uh, clearly during the british time uh, western instruments had kind of found their way in um, and there were obviously um, the, the the expat i mean if you will the british uh, the children of you know british people living here etc would obviously learn uh, violin and piano and so on um and then the obviously some of that uh, some of the indians in that sort of orbit obviously picked up that instrument and then clearly uh balu swami dikshit uh, is the one who sort of uh, while well, i'm sure there have been would have been many others but he's the name that we kind of know now um as the one who eventually uh, sort of adapted it to the carnatic style of uh, expressive 
the melodic, the bends, and the uh, and the sort of continuum, uh, sort of sounds that you normally associate with uh, uh, Carnatic music. Uh, and I think you know, since then, uh, uh, we we haven't looked uh, back. And and I purely, if I think now, purely even in a sound engineering standpoint, um, for the most part, uh, at that point of time, vocalists were men, uh, not not that many women vocalists, right? Um, and the violin has always been in the Western uh, tradition. Uh, the violin is the female voice. Okay. Um, so the, the, the uh, in string instruments, basically the the double bass and the cello. The double bass is the baritone male voice. The the cello is the bass male voice. Um, and then the the viola is sort of like the the tenor alto tenor sort of male female both. And then the violin is the female voice. Right, so it spans the full range of the female voice from the the contralto to the soprano. Right, the higher string, the E string. I mean, you're going to go at pretty high. That's the soprano range. So it's the string instruments were originally designed to match exactly the vocal ranges of all of the different kinds of people in the choir. Uh, right, and then the orchestra basically just over time. Uh, the human voice became less important. Uh, the, just the orchestra was largely just the instruments, unless it was an opera and so on. Um, so it's basically so you can sort of think that it's 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 quite a natural fit, right? Uh, so if you have a male voice um, having a female voiced string instrument, just makes the whole thing sonically more pleasing and more filled, right? As opposed to just two male voices, right? So so again, you know, purely from a frequency sort of band standpoint. It's just a more filling experience, right? So, which is why I think you know, I uh, recently I was just speaking to I don't know if it was TM Krishna or someone else you know, randomly in some Twitter spaces or something. I was like, you know, uh, have you ever thought about um, for now that we have women vocalists, maybe the accompanist for a women vocalist ought to be a cellist because that would be the male voice. That's an interesting thought because I've always wondered why yeah. is yes. like what is the difference between violin and cello? You know, they look the yeah. same. Uh, so just... they're basically just a uh, one octave less. So ah, you play okay. uh, one octave less, yes. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So did you get a chance to play professionally? I know you had a stint in the US as well. So I you... yeah I did. I mean till till my mid twenties I used to play semi professionally. I mean in the sense that you know uh, always stuck to IT as a as a profession and you know in the US it just used to. So uh, I had a, a a colleague of mine who was a, a Kumbhakonam Rajapayar uh, student and so therefore you know we were a package deal for all of the people uh, in the US wanting to bring over Carnatic musicians. They wouldn't have to bring over a violinist and a guitar uh, and a, and a bridangist, right? So that was a a nice combination. So for about uh, two or three years, we were just doing that. Uh, but yeah, but otherwise, I've I've never been a a major fan of the. Um, I guess in the sense that for me, novelty is always important. And over time, I I kind of got tired of the that sort of restrictive format uh, of Carnatic music. So so yeah. But otherwise, yeah. So but in general, I think you know, um, I yeah, I grew up uh, for the first uh, uh, two, two two and a half decades uh, largely just being uh, purely into Carnatic music. Yeah, I'm guessing you you are more of a solo violin performer, or you prefer solo performing more than accompanying Not, somebody. To be fa- to be fair, I think if you're a violinist, um, very very few people get to perform solo. Uh, you would have to be you would have to be a T. T- N. Krishnan or a Lal Gudi or someone at that level uh, to be able to. So otherwise, the audience there is no audience for a solo performer, unless one is that popular, right? Uh, so for the most part, I think. Uh, so even even Lalgudi and and T N Krishnan in their in the early part of their careers were accompanying artists for the most part. Um, so yeah, so it, it, largely again, you know, that's also kind of what made it uh, relatively sort of restrictive because I think you know you're in general the concert etiquette does not allow you to be more creative than the than the vocalist. Um, and over time you kind of realize that look, everybody is just memorizing everything and coming. There's really no actual improvisation happening um, at that level at least, right? And so you you know over time. So, but in that sense, yeah. So I, I largely grew up playing accompaniment, but sometimes um, I would sort of play solo, but then you know use that as an opportunity to try new things that you know wasn't always popular, right? I, I would I would sort of you know maybe do a fusion with some Ella Raja stuff, and then you know the the people wouldn't like it and say no 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 you're not supposed to play that. Uh, and, then, and over time, you know, I eventually, you know, I began to sort of, you know, and, and I, it might seem like a controversial opinion, but I think um, the amount of mus- pure musical, all-round musical creativity in some of Elay Raja's best songs, I, I mean, it, it just far outstrips 
pretty much any great Carnatic composition you can you can think about, right? In every every sense of the word. Right. Uh, a lot of what we essentially end up calling classical music has nothing to do with the inherent class of the music. It has to do with the class of the people listening to it. Uh, they have declared that this is what is good music, and that's really it's 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 a it's a subjective uh, choice than a truly just you know purely a musical. Uh, choice at that level, right? But yeah, I mean, it's 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 a classical form of music. It's a it's a beautiful form of music, right? I mean, but the the need to constantly glorify it as being somehow one level above film music and all of that, I you know, over time, I've sort of found it very uh, uh, hypocritical. If you will. Right, and I feel like film music over the years, especially Hindi Hindi film music or Tamil film music, has done far more experimentation than than traditional Absolutely. forms of Absolutely. music. Because and it has also it has also been far more democratic. It's also been far more inclusive. Uh, there have been more people of more backgrounds uh, who have been performers um, and made a living out of film music than from any of these classical uh, art forms. It's always been about exclusion, right? It's not. It cannot be classical if it was democratic, to be honest, right? It, then it's it's popular music in that case, right? And so this is clearly not popular music, right? Um, and so that has always been the case. Uh, but the interesting thing is that it's always uh, the uh, uh, popular music has always been open to borrowing from every art form. Um, and so you know uh, there are lots of Rahman songs that are very beautiful Carnatic melodies, as are Ilai Raja's songs, as are you know you name it, Emma Swishwaradan or whoever it is, right? Yeah. Right. Right. So sometimes I feel like classical music, the definition of classical music is being resistant to change. Um, is that is that a fair? Correct. Sure. I, well, so I think resistance to change is a is simply just a common feature that you find in a lot of things, right? I mean, you know, old people are resistant to change in general. Uh, you know, we are resistant to change when it comes to food. We are resistant to change in a lot of things, culture, uh, politics, and so on. So in that sense, I think that's just that kind of comes with the territory, if you will. My, I mean, over time, I think the the idea that classical music is basically um, exclusive art forms that the upper class, economic class, a social class uh, would like to keep for themselves is really my definition of uh, of what classical music is. Right? This this applies to Western classical. It applies to Hindustani classical, um, and and uh, South Indian classical. Yeah. Right. While performing um, violin in in the U.S. and while growing up. Has it ever happened that, you know, this is something that I've thought about myself, that if the violinist is more talented or has more improvisation skills than the vocalist, uh, does he usually underplay if the vocalist is not at par? Yes. Has it happened you, that you, you have, have underperformed? Yeah. Okay. You have to. You have to. Uh, I mean, in the sense that, well, you know, again, sometimes the vocalist just simply not there. They're tense and they 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 sort of miss notes and they're sometimes off key. It Sometimes it does happen. Inexperienced young people coming abroad for the first time. Yeah, in in that case, I guess you're you're, you're probably just going to try and salvage the whole thing by by just at least making sure that the audience gets something, right? So you know, at that point of time, the audience will look to the violinist and say, you know what, I've spent all this time. Singer's not great, so let me at least hear a decent alapana from you, right? So in that case, you can sort of make that choice. But um, if the if the singer is like generally competent and so on, uh, you are expected to kind of match that level and not compete uh, 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 with the singer. So that's generally the etiquette. Uh, and if you do, so have they have they shown tran tantrums or? Uh, not not like that. So it's okay. it's never a tantrum. It's more like you're probably not going to get called again. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the person's not going to talk to you uh, later and those kinds of things. But yeah, otherwise it's sort of like a um, the the. The point is that you know the these are these are not written rules in any sense. These are all just completely tacit rules. Uh, just people just make up on the way. Yeah, right, right. And um, a lot of people ask me, how do you how do you identify a raga? So I know you are a man of first principles. So yes. I wanted to ask you, can you teach someone how to identify a raga? Uh, I think I, it's, I it's, have I think this so. theory it's where a... yeah, I have this theory where you know you listen to one song and. Yeah. You listen to another song that is similar, and then yeah. if you mishmash them and ask people, do you do you see any similarity? And people actually identify that hey, there is yeah. some similarity. Um, so yeah. so what are your thoughts on that? How how can we make people understand? So the problem is that um, uh, if you ask an instrumentalist like me, and I'm somebody who plays the violin, cello, guitar, and so on, uh, somebody who's been playing instruments all my life, right? Um, instrumentalists fundamentally hear music very differently in their ears and in their brains than vocalists do. Um, a, a vocalist actually 
listen to a combination of uh, sound and 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 words together um instrumentalists don't hear words at all so sometimes i will listen to i i can listen to a song a thousand times and the words won't register at all uh, because the only thing i hear is notes and the moment you only hear notes then raga is just a simple basically to use a it term it's a lookup table right if i if i spot these five notes it's this raga that's as simple as that right uh, uh, of course there are ragas that will share the same notes in which case i'm doing the next thing which is looking at combinations right so is there a oh is it is it doing ma madhasa or is it you know uh, is it doing mapa and and so on so um, and then it's really just a it's a pattern matching right so in that at, at its most basic level if you can identify the notes being sung uh, then it's just a very straightforward thing and the way the melakarta ragas are structured there's a very sequential formula to it so uh, once you kind of know that then you kind of know where it exactly fits in and you know oh, this sounds like a, a janya of karahara priya and so you can sort of work your way up there but i do re- recognize that people who either did not learn instrumental music or purely learned only vocals and so on uh, they tend to use the the approximate similarity sense right so oh this sounds like mahaganapatim so it must be natai is how they think about it and the problem is that for an instrumentalist uh, no i really because i wouldn't remember the words of the song at all um so i largely just you know i would know that this is oh these are the notes and so this is obviously not a and so on so i think it is uh, yeah so therefore i think different people do this in in different ways uh, i think we're getting to that point i, I did see there was a i was at this ai conference where uh, this is brilliant hindustani position who's also a machine learning guy who worked at google um who who's who's now built these spectacular uh, new apps that are uh, upcoming that will happily recognize ragas quite easily right it was supposed to be a hard problem right you know back in the day but now it's like oh he said oh he got it done over a weekend right so that's how easy it is now oh like a pet project <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah pretty much and it's now releasing it as an app on uh, uh, iOS uh, and Android yeah, anytime oh, soon yeah that's great i'm yeah, yeah. really looking forward to it yeah. yeah yeah yes so you just you could just point it to a, you point it to any uh, any music um, and it will uh, so so that he said the hardest problem was actually identifying the sa right uh that's the hard problem because based on which you identify as the sa uh the root that's how you identify because if you identify the wrong sa then you know you could end up with a different raga which by the way is technically not wrong uh that's not the point right i mean music is so it's just that in indian music we consider everything absolute in terms of where the sa is right in terms of the shruti and so on not so in western music right so because the within a song the scale can change in fact in a mozart movement the scale will keep changing um and and so in fact you could be playing the same notes but because the scale changed the feel of the entire music will change right um, I, i actually by the way there are ilai raja songs where he has used this trick right it's just simply just change the scale at the same set of notes now suddenly it signal another raga yeah so oh that brings me about you know instrumentalists in carnatic music uh, and and vocalists right like like you said vocalist yeah. is sort of the king of the concert uh, and vocalists yeah. sort of identify themselves pretty uniquely with their style of singing what we call bani right or uh, yes yes or their voice yeah, or the gharana or whatever right yeah exactly uh, how, how does an instrumentalist stand out uh, you know i'm asking this question in per- particular in terms of uh, how violinist violinists yeah. distinguish themselves for example a kunna kudi and l subramanian uh, or yeah. uh, tn krishnan Yes. I mean, if if you have heard Carnatic music long enough, you can identify that yes. this is El Subramanian. Can identify who it is. Yes. But yeah. uh, but but can you tell me, like, for for people who are learning the violin, how can you distinguish yourself? Yes. So, from others. So in general, I think the the two sort of broad styles, at least when it comes to violin, has always been the gayaka style and the and the other one is sort of more. Uh, uh, shall we just say that it spotlights the instrument as opposed to. Uh, right the, and the instrument strength so that's t and krishna is basically that right uh, he uses a uh, a really really uh, expensive really good german violin um, and uh, the sound and and the string um, and and his notes and the way he constructs his phrases are all designed to show off the instrument and also to construct variations and phrases that are unique to the instrument in the sense that it would be hard to sing it um and that this is this is this can come only out of the violin so that's what the incursion was um lalgudi on the other hand essentially made the violin as close 
uh, to the human voice as possible in terms of the that sort of continuous wave that the bends and the, the sound not really as much focus on 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 bow control and, and things like that so a, an actual serious uh, a violinist would would sort of say that lalgudi didn't have great bow, bowing technique because that's not what he focused on lalgudi's genius was entirely in his fingers um, and in the fact that the way they moved made it sound very much like somebody was singing you could put words to it uh, and you could just hear those words while he was playing um keen krishnan actually sounded like uh, a western classical symphony orchestra person playing carnatic music um and it sounded like the violin it just sounded exactly like that and you couldn't sing some of those phrases uh, uh and, and then i think you can listen to his um, i think his is brova barama and you'll kind of know the sangathi is in I love bro, his brova barama are actually uh, uh would would sound very odd when sung if at all they were very talented of course because the human voice is indeed the most versatile instrument right there's nothing it's it would be it would be sort of arrogant to say that a human voice cannot replicate that yes of course there are there are human voices who can right um but it won't sound as good coming from a voice as it does from a violin because it's about the bowing the intensity the speed of the bow the staccato the many other expressions that he's able to bring closer to a western classical style and it also kind of goes back to how i think his father learned western classical violin uh from uh, Uh, from a, a british uh, uh, a violin teacher so so you can sort of see where that that, that barnik sort of comes from it comes from a western classical style uh, whereas uh, i'm pretty certain i think uh, lalgudi's family uh, violin was more of a self taught thing right um, and some genius i mean he himself was a, i'm sure he was a child prodigy and so he would have uh, so, 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 sort of picked it up and then he just made it sound like the human voice uh, and it's also quite interesting so if you look at how mandalin srinivas he 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 really makes the instrument do things that you cannot do with the voice right he treats it like the guitar it is it's it's actually not really even a mandolin it's a very small sized electric guitar it's a very custom built uh, instrument for him right um a sort of uh, like guitar persona or something like that right a guitar persona just uses a full size guitar and you know mandolin uses a smaller size one which allows him to do things at a high speed uh play certain phrases that you simply cannot uh, sort of sing right so i think you know broadly i would just say instrumentalists sort of fall in these two uh, categories not really much whereas vocal styles because words are involved and so therefore words can be pronounced in certain ways uh, either clearly or in a, in a more continuous sense so that has a uh, sometimes slightly nasally sometimes not so and so on so there are many more dimensions to the human voice uh in that they sound unique they they sort of look they they look like they came from a certain school and so on uh with instruments it's just really just these two things okay yeah so any thoughts on um the future of carnatic music because one of the reasons why i'm asking this question is i see you, videos on youtube with great presentation and production quality of carnatic yeah. songs like agam yes. you have uh, people yes. doing bands and they yeah. get millions of views and it it amazes Absolutely. me why why yep. uh, carnatic music is not as popular outside of uh, yeah. you know the the realms of south india uh, yep. so is is that the future like good packaging good production it's not so much i think it is also about the openness to uh, one the openness to sort of let others in one uh, the second thing is openness to let your people also do other things right i i remember i think you know uh the, the generation prior to mine uh the biggest controversy was yesudas deciding to switch from singing carnatic to singing films you know it was sort of seen as like a betrayal of songs right yeah. um but yeah but in my generation everyone from mudi krishnan to everyone was basically doing both um uh and 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 now you know uh, there are people who are not doing the traditional concert format at all but you know no one can tell me that harish shivaramakrishnan uh i'd be hard pressed to find somebody who can sing rangapura vihara better than uh, hari shiv ramakrishnan yes and he sings it in a rock setting because that's his choice and i think in that sense i think uh musical genres i think in a modern day sense are a lot less relevant um in 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 a time when content or concert experiences or music or art experiences were very limited um and you had to wait for the season to go see someone uh, tv you could barely see something uh, once in a while you would listen to something on radio and so on to the time where we are people are listening to streaming music or music of their choice 24/7 while they're commuting and so we live in a, a an age of abundance and in an age of artistic abundance i think genres actually are meaningless 
uh, right? So, you know, there is like the, the one of the things that recently went to number one before being banned and taken down was a completely AI generated song that featured The Weeknd and um, uh, I think one Drake, of Drake. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, Drake and The Weeknd, right? Um, they didn't even sing it. So, so I, all I'm saying is that I think we really need to rethink what the genre itself means. If you think the genre comes along with a ton of baggage, a ton of these rules, a ton of concert settings, a, a style, a specific a set of rules um, and membership criteria and so on, that will remain. There's no doubt. I, I think the, the the music season will will continue to happen. Um, but don't expect it to get like, you know, the 100 million uh, YouTube views, if you will. Right? I, I think that's going to be... Uh, Essentially, you need to be able to target a larger audience of people by packaging it in ways, uh, by combining it with other genres that have larger audiences, right? You know, so I would actually say it's not Carnatic fans who are essentially flocking to listen to Hari Siva Ramakrishnan, but it's an entirely new audience of rock and pop fans who are now saying, hey, you know what? That Carnatic thing that I used to find insanely, intolerably boring now sounds cool. Right. I mean, I think it's there's something to think about. Right? I, I'm not saying every single one of those uh, experiments are necessarily going to work. But in an age of abundance, I think, you know, uh, for every hundred such failures, there will be one Hari Shiva Ramakrishnan or, or any of these other. You know, even there was Yodaka a while back. They were really superb. They were really gorgeous. Darbuka Shiva and a bunch of others who uh, a lot more. It wasn't even like hard rock. It was like very acoustic instruments. A very almost a post rock equivalent of Carnatic, right? Post Carnatic almost. Uh, very beautiful, very properly sung Carnatic music, but set in a very sort of acoustic indie band setting, right? It wasn't like loud and uh, it's the sort of thing that you know even even somebody like my father would absolutely enjoy and say this really sounds nice. I, mean, I have no complaints, right? You know, it's not it's not like rock. And there's uh, I don't have that association of all that blasphemy and all of that long hair and all of those you know, drugs and all of that. You know, I I can still sense devotion and all of that. So. I think there's going to be a spectrum of this. So in that sense, I think genres are largely meaningless uh, in yeah. this context. I think even shows like Coke Studio and Music Mojo, absolutely. Uh, they have played a, yes. quite a big part. You you point out the fact that Carnatic music is quite different from Western music uh, in the sense that it does not have as much documentation. As an instrumentalist, you know, you you told me how you think about us, uh, think of a song like Swaras. Yes. How does how does not having documentation help train? It's very hard. Uh, so it's, it's quite fascinating that the textbooks we still use for Carnatic music were all written by this one gentleman in the 20th century called Professor Samba Bhuti, And that's it. Okay. There's no other version. Nothing else. Right. For beginner, uh, Varnam and that. Every one of those things formalized and written down first by this guy. Right. E- everything before then was orally transmitted. Right. Um and, and the, by the way, this isn't unique to music. This is unique to Indian culture and history in general. You know, we didn't write down the Vedas, okay, for two thousand years, right? We roughly believe they were, you know, uh, four thousand years old. But the that the oldest written version of the Vedas is like five hundred AD. Like so, uh, we have no idea what was lost, and how many versions. Because if you have oral transmission. Everybody is going to make some small changes. You're, you're going to have like tons of variations. Lost and in translation. No, no, not only that. That's exactly what it is. In fact, you do have like four or five versions of the Yajur Veda. Right? And so then, so the problem is that this is this is not just a Carnatic music thing. Um, and it's just a, it's a, it's, it's like a cultural quirk that we have picked up uh, because the feeling was that um, not writing things down uh, allowed you to create membership criteria uh, and ownership. Uh, it's because once you write things down, that knowledge is now democratized. Right? See, in a sense that the entire world, the printing press moved the world ahead so fast is because for the first time, uh, knowledge could actually be freely be accessed by anyone. You didn't need membership criteria uh, to know someone who could pass that knowledge to you, who could deny you that knowledge. Um, and in the context of India, it's always been about caste, right, uh, or religion, and, and so on, right. So you know, you had to be from a certain caste to get this kind of knowledge. You had to be from that caste, and all. And and so therefore, I think that the same thing applied to music. Uh, so till obviously the 20th century, uh, many of these Indians who then studied English and so on started to realize that I think there's value in in writing things down. Um, and then suddenly there was this huge. Uh, 
the 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 period from like 1870s to the 1930s was this insanely massive period where so many things were written down in india for the first time right and and weirdly enough you know here my most fascinating uh, story that i often tell is that uh, all of us have grown up reading panchatantra right you know we probably read the panchatantra probably in like a you know amar chitra katha you know uh, sense right in some sense right now the amar chitra katha is an a simplified adaptation of you would think vishnu sharma's original panchatantra it is not right because what you see as vishnu sharma's panchatantra in sanskrit is a 16th century sanskrit translation of a persian version of panchatantra and the persian version was a translation of the original panchatantra from thousands of years ago we never wrote that down but the persians did so we got it back from the persians oh very interesting i've heard the same yeah. about yeah, yoga exactly. as well uh, the exactly. yoga that so we you know so you see you see this everywhere right yeah. yeah so in fact i wouldn't be surprised if somewhere in afghanistan or uzbekistan that there is somewhere there's going to be some scroll we find which has the original rigveda somewhere and all of a sudden we'll realize oh whatever we've been learning sounds nothing like it or or is or is significantly different right uh, and so so my the point i'm trying to make is that the 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 lack of documentation is just a, is just a feature of indian history it's i i don't want to judge it one way or another but uh, it is it is in a sense had the larger impact of people generally uh having a more fluid idea of of many of these things religion fluid idea of music fluid idea of that and so on right uh, and people being comfortable uh, uh with contradictions right the same epic will say two different things and people are completely okay with it uh and and so on so in that sense uh it also gives uh, people from this part of the world the ability to for instance apply the rigorous idea of newtonian mechanics to launch an isro rocket but have absolutely no problems conducting a homam or a puja before uh, uh, before it launches uh, and not f- whereas a, a scientist in nasa is is almost culturally expected to be an atheist because there it's either religion or science you can't have both right but because here here it's because there are two books right and here everything is sort of fluid everything is in flux you you can absolutely be an iit professor in physics and also believe in astrology it's perfectly fine right um, so in that sense i think there is a certain fluidity to that uh, the way we think about this and the way bhakti is and where the way these songs are written and so on obviously i think that's worth appreciating but at the same time from a pedagogy standpoint i think it is it has been a unfortunate thing because you you it has allowed you to one try and keep this art form you know in in one community um, and and not you know allow you to uh, sort of not extend that uh, to people outside uh, and so on right and hopefully i think uh, now obviously the internet era uh, you know for, as far as i remember there used to be a, 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 a rensselaer polytechnic there used to be this professor there called shivakumar right i mean you know you, every time you google for a song yeah, it's his page i mean uh, the man has really done a fantastic job of digitizing uh, the notation of almost everything you know uh, you can find and now the the internet and the number of apps and the, the simply the number of youtube uh, resources available for you to learn uh, i think it's has completely changed the world but yeah that's the history uh, that it sort of come from so I, i i still find it funny when people take it very seriously as someone no 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 you have to go sit with the teacher to learn not true at all i think you know uh, autodidact uh, being an autodidact is is easier now than it ever was yeah i think we somehow glorify uh, things like kelvigyanam in music and kaipunyam in cooking and, and so on and and to your point of um, yeah. amar chitra katha i think it's it's pretty similar with yoga as well i mean i recently learned that Absolutely. whatever Absolutely. asanas that we that we know of today was written by yeah. this one sort yeah. of a court person in in mysore patambira ma joyce yeah, yeah, yeah. and yes, he was the yes. only person who documented all these asanas yeah. and yes. the sanskrit so even, name, even... yeah exactly so there are so many even you know some of the things i remember were growing up vedic mathematics that the, all these other fancy things people don't realize they were written some 100 years ago by some guy they had nothing to do with right. the vedas okay 
right um, it is just that but because people don't re- realize that nothing was written down in the past it was all orally transmitted which is astonishing in itself i mean you have to give that right i mean yeah. uh, uh, the, it's an astonishing feat of memory and uh, and and so on it's uh, yes amazing but yeah but it wasn't written down it wasn't printed yeah that was the end of episode 1 of my conversation with ashok we'll be back with episode 2 soon till then peace <laughs>